And today I want to talk to you about, it's the second part of our statement of faith, uh, that's our mission statement. Our mission statement is that we're putting legs to faith. Legs, L-E-G-S. Last week we discussed the responsibility of loving God. And, and we actually pointed out the fact that Jesus said that to love God means you also got to love one another. Loving God is not just about having a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, not just being forgiven of your sins, not just having Him die and raise from the dead for you, but loving God, if you really love God, means you've also got to love other people. There has to be this love relationship with others as well, and that that may actually include somebody you don't like. The way Jesus said it is you even are supposed to love and pray for your enemies. Enemies. Which, by the way, the person you don't like sitting next to you at worship. <laughs> Some of you looked at your spouses, that's funny. <laughs> but there's truth to that too, isn't there? You all have some times you don't like that spouse, <laughs> right? Come on, be honest. There's sometimes, there's sometimes. I can tell you this, maybe you always like them. There's sometimes they don't like you. <laughs> so this week, we're at the second phrase. And the phrase is encouraging one another. And, and what it means to in, encourage one another. We're going to look at... Um, oh, just in case the computer stops working like it did earlier... We're going to look at um, one of Paul's letters, um, in this case to the, um, to the Thessalonian church, in which he is actually giving encouragement to the Thessalonians. In it, he re and this is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is, if you look at this whole letter, and even First and Second Timothy as well, where he's encouraging Timothy in his ministry, he's giving them counsel and encouragement and instruction. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11, it says, Therefore... Encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Now, we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, Encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. What is encouragement? The way Jesus said it, and he described it in John 14, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The word advocate is the word that we translate encouragement, encourager. It comes from the same root. It's a paraclete. This, this is the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. The advocate, the paraclete, a comforter. The literal translation of a paraclete is one who comes alongside you. We need people who will come alongside of us and encourage us. This is someone who comes alongside to help and to render some kind of service to, to us. If you get a flat tire and you don't know how to change the tire, what do you do? You've, have you seen the commercial lately? You call your insurance company and they send out somebody. But if your insurance doesn't cover you, you're in trouble, right? Like the young man who goes, sure, Dad, I know what a lug wrench is. It's holding up something that's clearly not a lug wrench. <laughs> we need people who will come alongside of us and help us and render service to us when we're in need. The paracletos is also one who gives comfort when we're distressed, who, who comes and lifts us up, who who was there to, when a person collapsed on the ground, literally would pick them up. And you've all seen examples of that in the Olympics and other uh, competitions where maybe somebody fell down and, and one runner stops and goes back and picks them up. This especially, by the way, happens in the Special Olympics, more so than it does in the normal Olympics because the Special Olympics kids tend to have more love for one another. Out there on the regular competitive field, we kind of don't care about them, we just care about us. 
a paracletus, as so I said, one who comes alongside, one who picks people up that are, that are collapsed. A paracletus is also one who was the, like the person who came in a trial. And you were, everyone else was speaking against you. And this one person comes up and they speak for you in your behalf. That was the paraclete. That was the one who was an advocate on your behalf, who spoke truth and, and supported you and defended you and counseled you when you're in trouble. And then finally, the word parakalein or parakaleo, the, um, the actual verb for this, is the word for exhorting people to noble deeds and high thoughts. It's the word of courage before battle. It's what a, a, a soldier's a leader will say, you know, before we go into this battle. So if you, if you want a great example of that, go watch the movie Braveheart. And he's, I don't know how they all heard him, okay? That's a whole other thing. You know, Hollywood was able to do it. But anyways, <laughs> Braveheart's riding up and down, and he's preparing his soldiers for battle as they're getting ready, and many of them will die, and they're going to go out there and fight. It's, that's the parakalein, the parakaleo. That's the one who comes along and helps us out. Paul says to the Thessalonians, we're supposed to encourage those who work hard. <laughs> he uses a word that some of us don't like, incidentally. He says, we're supposed to encourage those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. <laughs> who make you feel bad on a Sunday morning because they preach something that you'd rather they didn't say. Who make you feel uncomfortable like I did when he put it, that video up there. And you say, oh, why do we have to be uncomfortable on Sunday morning? We are supposed to pray for those who admonish us. Yes, who make us feel uncomfortable. Yes, we're supposed to be encouraging and blessing those who are working hard. And that includes moms and dads, right? En encourage yes, come on, moms and dads. <laughs> encouraging moms and dads who have to what? Who, who love you, clean up all the messes, and they have to admonish you. Yeah, kids, I know. You say, you know, we don't like the admonishment. Someday you will. Someday you'll be thankful for it. <laughs> you, it's, you will. <laughs> because you'll remember that they loved me so much, they cared about me so much, they wanted to help me be that special person. They didn't want to ignore me. And the scripture is so clear in this. The Father disciplines those he loves. Now, I didn't say that he is brutally beating them or abusing them or anything like that. But Father God, who loves us so much that he's willing to discipline, willing to correct, willing to admonish, we need to encourage those who are working hard like that among us. Paul goes on, he says, we need to encourage those who care for you. In Acts 20, he says, be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. And by the way, an encourager is going to do it like that, right? They're not going to like, you know, come on, you stupid good for nothing. You get up off the ground and you, 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 you be successful. No, no, no. That's not encouragement, is it? That's abuse. That's disrespect. But Paul says, look, I've cried for you. I've wept for you as I've tried to warn you. And he's speaking specifically of the Thessalonians and the Ephesians and the Colossians and the Corinthians. He says, look, I've, I've prayed over you. I've wept with you and wept for you. I've had such a burden for you. And Paul says here now, encourage those who have that kind of concern for you. 1 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Parents, isn't that discipline? Aren't you really trying to warn them? Now watch out if you're just, if you're just uh, punishing out of anger, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the moment you need to sit back. <laughs> when, when you're angry, stop and hold yourself for a while so that you can move back into love. And now warn your dear children. Colossians 1.28 says, He is the one we proclaim admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Why do you come every week? Why do you come listen to sermons? Because I know there's times that some of the things I say in these sermons are not meant to tickle your ears and make you feel good. They're meant to challenge you. They're meant to push us each because I have to listen too, by the way. They're meant to push us each to try to really honor God with our lives and really live for Him. 
and to recognize that there's things in us that need to be corrected, that need to be changed, and that we need to work and say, are we listening to God or not? And if we're really listening, that sometimes there's going to be conviction that comes when we're listening. And that you shouldn't just come here, sit, say, no, okay, nice sermon, go back out and do whatever you were doing the rest, of the, the rest of the week. When do you really need to be a Christian? Tomorrow. <laughs> or when you leave here and you want to get coffee before somebody else. <laughs> or, or you're ticked off because uh, the, the, the restaurant's full already because Bill went over too long. You know, or all those kids. That's when, that's when you start really... In the moment, in the now, all the time, all the time. Not just look like one because you look pretty on Sunday morning. You especially look pretty. Yeah, you, you especially look pretty on Sundays. <laughs> Love you, Mike. <laughs> he goes on, he says, you need to warn those who are idle and disruptive. Actually, put, <laughs> I love the word here for warning. Put some sense into their head. <laughs> get them to get it. <laughs> you need to alert them of the serious consequences of their actions. Romans 15 says this way, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. And you are. I am writing not to shame you, but to warn you. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you, this is Colossians 3, 16, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. You're supposed to actually use your singing, <laughs> your worship, your words to encourage and to admonish one another. Now, don't forget, there is a danger there in my admonishing somebody else, right? If I'm going to admonish you about something, I need to be examining myself as well. I also need to be very careful that if I'm going to try to help you with your sin, I'm in danger of falling into sin as well. One of the big ones is I'm in danger of going and gossiping about it. I'm in danger of criticizing. I'm in danger of thinking negative and, and all those kinds of things. But notice, the Bible doesn't say, therefore, don't do it. But instead, we have a responsibility a responsibility to one another. He goes on, he says, we're supposed to encourage the disheartened. Encourage those who are worn out, those who are discouraged, those who are feeling broken, those who are ready to give up, those who just say, I just, I, I just can't do it. Encourage the disheartened. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. Did you? Yeah, see, see, what we know is, is that some of you didn't respect your father's discipline. Some of you didn't feel respected or loved by your father when your father disciplined. But, but the writer of Hebrews is trying to say, but there's a, there's a good father who's disciplined us because they cared about us. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. And, th and that's one of the things we also have to remember, right? For every dad out there that's made a mistake and blown it, they were trying to do their best job. Their jo best job was obviously not perfect and sometimes riddled with imperfection. But they were trying to do their best at disciplining and guiding you. They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. And then he goes on. He says, and no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak <coughs> knees. The weak and disheartened may actually be those who are starting to fall in to some trap, some sin, some error in their lives that's starting to take life and joy away from them. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Thessalonians 2. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. 
Paul obviously had a dad that loved him and he had great respect for him. Or maybe he didn't. Maybe he had an abusive dad, but he still came to understand that there was value in discipline. Isaiah says it this way, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Interesting mixture of terms there. Encourage each other. You're going to be strengthened because God's going to come. And he's going to come to do what? Retribution. He's going to come for judgment. But he's coming to save you. And as Jesus comes back again someday, yes, he will come back for judgment, but he will come back to save and to take us to heaven for those who want to go. Ray Stedman said, Paul's referring to the one who feels inadequate and ungifted. We would call them the introverts among us. Help them find their place, says the apostle. This is, is addressed to everybody. People who feel out of it, who think they do not belong and cannot contribute anything, must be helped to find their place because they do have a place. Every person here, and that includes the children who just went to children's worship, have something that they can give to other people and give to the Lord. Paul goes on, he says, help the weak. To help someone literally means to hold on by them, to hold oneself over against, to keep close to. In, order, in other words, to help somebody, you've got to literally grab a hold of them and hold them up. We who are strong, Romans 15 says, ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Jude says it this way, be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To show others, to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Paul Hebert writes, let the strong put their arms around the weak and hold them up. They need to be assured that they are not forgotten or despised because of their helplessness. What did the girls need to do at the coffee shop that day? To a girl who was even still high, put their arms around her and help her and hold on to her. And that's the work that God's called each of us to do. Again, Stedman says, those who do not know very much about the doctrine of the Christian life, who have not learned the truth that sets them free, need extra help. Did you hear me? Those who don't understand how much God loves them need extra help. Perhaps they're not sure of their salvation or they feel guilty about the past and do not sense they have really been forgiven yet by God. Whatever it may be, the word is to help them to hold them fast. That demands a little extra effort, a phone call perhaps, an invitation to lunch, or a quiet talk about their needs. This is addressed to us all. We are all to watch out for one another like this. That's what they're doing at the pregnancy center. They're getting along girl, side of girls. You, you think about being a counselor there. You don't have to have the answers. You just got to care. Put your arm around somebody and hug them and hold them and, and just be, be care about them. Paul goes on, he says, we need to be patient with one another, everyone. I'll move on since none of us want to wait for this one, right? Be patient, right? You all enjoy that? Be long-tempered. The picture of this word is that of a person of whom it takes a long time before fuming and breaking into flames. Some of us are not like that. Some of us have short fuses. <laughs> Boy, you should see all the elbowing like this today. That going on. <laughs> so some of us, some of us have short fuses, right? In fact, we all do it to some extent. And at some point in time, all of us become impatient with someone else at some point. Sometimes even angry. Some of us just have a quicker fuse and get qu impatient quicker, but maybe worse and maybe more angry. And Paul says, "Be patient." Be long-tempered, long-suffering is that admiral quality that refuses readily to yield to anger and retaliation in the face of provocation or irritation. I'm not going to give in to arguing back with you. I'm not going to fight back with you. And it holds back. It's the simplest of terms. Patience is willingness to keep trying over and over again. How did Paul say it in 1 Corinthians? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it is, does not boast, it is not proud. Or First Peter, Peter said, The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Why doesn't Jesus come back? He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come 
to repentance. And then Paul said it in Timothy, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Be patient with who? Did you have to be listening? <laughs> There's no outs there, kids. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, and that starts with yourself. Don't retaliate. Jesus said, it's, the, the Old Testament said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, right? You know, okay, I'm going to get you back for what you did to me. No, no. New Testament, he says, forgive. New Testament, he says, love. New Testament, love your neighbor. The Old Testament, he said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. Sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. One of the things that I've so appreciated from the crisis pregnancy centers is, is that they come alongside of girls who have already had an abortion. Some of those girls might even be in their 60s and 70s who had an abortion years ago but never were able to accept the forgiveness of God. They know that they did something. They're broken because of it. And they come alongside of them and instead of saying, you are, you're a terrible person. Can't believe you murdered your baby. No, they come alongside of them and love them to healing, to forgiveness, to wholeness. Because God cares about every one of us who sins. Do not repay, Romans, Paul said, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. You see, you don't need to go out there and try to take down that person for something they're doing. God's going to do that. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, what should you do? Feed them. If he is thirsty, what should you do? Give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you hate Donald Trump, what should you do? Pray for him. Pray for him. If you love Donald Trump, what should you do? Pray for him. Yeah, yeah. If you didn't like President Obama, what should you do? Pray for him. If you don't like Planned Parenthood in the abortion industry, what should you do? Pray for them. So are we? Always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Always keep looking for ways to show kindness to someone else. Matthew Henry says, in general, we must study to do what is our duty and pleasing to God in all circumstances, whether men do us good turns or ill turns. Whatever men do to us, we must do good to others. No matter what somebody says to you, no matter how they treat you, what are you supposed to do? And this is what moms and dads say to kids, right? So what if he treated you mean you treat him nice? Easy for you to say, mom, okay? And it is easy to say and much harder to do. And yet, that's what God is wanting us to do, to always strive to do what is good. Yep. My um, computer didn't move everything over that I had in it, so a couple things that I want, want to ask you. So are, are you, are you an encourager? Are you the kind of person who comes alongside of other people, listens to them, and even is willing to say, you know what, I think you're making a mistake? <coughs> do, do you love and care about your brothers, your sisters, your friends, your family enough to say something to them if you see them falling, if you see them stumbling, if you see them getting broken? Do you come alongside and help them? Or do you do the other thing that Christians oftentimes do and go talk to somebody else about them? because that is not encouragement. Encouragement is where we take the time to listen to one another, hear one another's struggles, and build the kind of trust relationship with one another that we can say to somebody, I think you're making a mistake. I care about you enough that I need to warn you about what I see happening in your life. 
Are you an encourager? Are you, are you one who, who comes along somebody who's down on the ground, hurt and broken, and you pick them up and you show them love, you show them support? You feel their pain, and so you grab a hold of them and hug them. Are you one who can go into a coffee shop and put your arm around a girl who's high and still show her the love of Jesus Christ so that she doesn't commit, go commit suicide? Are you an encourager? But there's another question as well. Are you open to encouragement? Are you, have you opened yourself up so someone else knows you well enough to be able to speak into your life, to speak encouragement to your life, to be able to be a blessing to you, to be able to say, yeah, you can do this. I believe in you. And you have enough relationship with them that you believe them. Are you open to encouragement? And if not, if you're not an encourager and you're not open to an encouragement, why not? What's keeping you from it? What, what things are hindering you from encouraging other people like God wants you to do? Is it just that you haven't made yourself vulnerable? I mean, isn't that why we do life groups? I know some of you say, yeah, that's why I'm not going to a life group. Because I don't want anyone to know my stuff. Because if I go to a life group, eventually they're going to know because I can't hide it. And some of you are not open to encouragement. That's why you're not going to a life group. You're not building the relationships with other believers because you don't want them to see. And the sad thing is, they're just as messed up as you are. <laughs> they're not sitting over there saying, oh, I can't wait till we get a dirty one in here so that I don't look so bad. <laughs> I'll be that guy <laughs> Even you're not dirty enough, man. Can't go away. You can't go back that far, Mike. <laughs> so what is it that's keeping us from the kind of relationships where we encourage one another? That get out there into that world because, folks, that is a very discouraging world out there. And, there, and, and people are going through a lot of garbage, and some of it's at the, by their own choosing. And do we, are we willing to do the stuff so that we can go out there and encourage them? because that's what God's calling us to do. Encourage the idle and those that are, dis I like the one word there, that are disruptive among you. <laughs> Have you ever noticed how messy people are disruptive? How broken people can disrupt things? <laughs> like at the coffee shop. Have you noticed? And God's calling what for us? To go and encourage one another. I pray God that you will teach us how to do it, that you'll help us not to be afraid, that you'll help us, Lord, to, to come to one another, even maybe when we're struggling. And God, th there's some kind of lie out there that says if you're being tempted, don't tell because the people will think bad at you. And that, that lie is keeping us from the kind of strength and encouragement and assistance that we need so we won't give in to sin. Lord God, we need to care more about each other rather than less. We need to hold one another up. We need to put our arms around one another. We need to give strength and support to each other when we're in the middle of the battle. We need to not feel like we're having fingers pointed at us, but hands that are wrapped around us and arms that are loving us. God, help us to be people of encouragement. And help us not to be afraid to accept the encouragement of someone who loves us. Even if that means being disciplined. Even if that means them speaking the truth to us in love. God, God help us to accept encouragement as a blessing. And may we be that blessing for one another. May we finish and continue this commitment you've called us to, to put legs to our faith, not just to love you and love one another, but to love one another so much that we give encouragement to each other. In the name of Jesus Christ. Jason Granger was a, um, a ranger in the army. 
lived here on the mountain, grew up here, family is from the mountain. Jason uh, was also a um, young man who trained skydivers. And he did all the, the, all the different kinds of training, nighttime skydiving, the danger ones, and the freezing, the, I mean, you name it. If there was a method of skydiving, Jason taught his soldiers how to come out safely. Three years ago, Jason was um, skydiving, and his mom and nephew and a couple of other people all decided to go skydiving together. It was mom's first time. And they jumped out of the plane. She was in a, a backpack with, you know, another, another uh, jumper because uh, so she, she didn't know, obviously, how to do it. And as they were coming down, somebody went over Jason's canopy with their canopy. Now, if you know anything about the dynamics of what the happens when you go over another canopy, all of a sudden the canopy below has no wind. There's nothing to stop it. And so basically you're now just diving. The problem was he was only about 300 feet from the ground. He tried to do a maneuver in which he turned himself upside down, tried to reset the canopy, but he ended up still striking the ground. Jason's sons, nieces and nephews were all there watching because grandma was coming down as well for her first jump. At Jason's funeral, a young man got up at the service and he talked about Jason and what Jason had done for him. Jason had suffered himself from PTSD and had tried to help other soldiers. And this young, young man who got, I say got up, I need to be more ap appropriate. He was sitting in a wheelchair. He went to the front of the room. And from that wheelchair, he spoke to the crowd. And he spoke, he says, I especially would need to speak to my brothers who are in the military and my sisters who have served. He says, I need to speak to you. He says, Jason saved my life. He helped me see Jesus Christ. And maybe the reason, oh my, maybe the reason Jason died was to get you guys to deal with your life with Jesus Christ, to get you to face, do you believe that Jesus died for you? Do you believe that God really cares about you? Maybe that's why, and he's saying this, fallen. Maybe that's why my friend Jason died to, so that because God was trying to get your attention. That's how important encouragement is brothers and sisters do you believe because there are people dying to make sure that we would have life like Jason's friend did that day do you believe and if you don't say yes I'm sorry it's as straightforward as that Say yes. Okay, Jesus. Yes. I'm going to follow you. And maybe you've been one of those Christians that's been kind of gotten away from Jesus. And he's kind of come unimportant to you. Or your relationship's just shallow and you know it. It's the same thing. Oh, God is, God is grabbing you with his arms and trying to wrap him you up in those loving arms to let you know he loves you and he wants so much more to you say yes come back come back and follow him and maybe you've been a nice good Christian and you've done good things and you work hard around the church but have you been an encouragement to somebody who's on the road to hell have you been an encouragement to somebody who's broken? Are you willing to build a relationship with someone so that you can be that kind of a encourager? Say yes.